So, of course, this made me think about, uh, uh, hopefully some of you recognize this, with Dr. Sheldon Cooper, Fun with Flags. So I thought I'd go, Dr. Ellen Dolly's Fun with Animal Facts. <laughs> All right, you recognize this? That's Marion, right? And I'm looking at her, of course, when I'm, when I'm watching a film, I'm always thinking, hmm, is it going to be accurate? So I'm looking at Marion, and I'm thinking, of course, it's this film, right? She's got that monkey on her shoulder. She's in Egypt. What monkey is that? It's a capuchin monkey, which is only found in Central and South America. So I'm, wait, 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 that's not right. And so I'm going to hear, I'm going to tell you a few things that may not be right in The Princess Bride. So the first thing is the rodents of unusual size. So if you look at this rodent's teeth, look carefully, or this RUI, this is a rodent. So this is a skull of a, of a uh, beaver. And if you look at the front, it's got some very large incisors, right? That you know how rodents, mice use those incisors, a gap behind it. Take a look at the rodent of unusual size. That's not right. So here's something that's a little bit closer. I'm going to look at the incisors and the teeth beyond that. So the incisors are the front teeth. So I think that's what this looks like. Don't you think the rodent of unusual size looks like the Selenodon? So this is the Hispaniola Selenodon, which is found in an island, obviously, in the Caribbean. And take a look. I mean, that animal, doesn't it look just like what Wesley was wrestling with? <laughs> and that's what its real size is. So there's a person holding it over there. So there, it's not a, it's not a rodent. It's actually a shrew-like creature. And if you want to know what a shrew looks like, the biggest shrew that's around, oh, I did have facts. Let's see if I can go back. I have to remind myself of these, that this animal is about a one and a half to three and a half pounds. That's how big it is. So that's about the biggest shrew-like creature there is. And the shrews that are around here, there are some. You probably don't see them unless your kitty cat brings them in. This is our biggest species, the short-tailed shrew. And you can see in the upper right that somebody's holding it, so it's not very big. And in, I've given you its size, 0 0.035 pounds. I put it in pounds for you. So it's not a very big animal. But it does have those scary teeth, right? And if you look at the top, the shrew-like skull there, compared to a small rodent, come on, the shrew is way scarier. And in fact, I found this. So Weird and Wild Creatures Wiki, of course, you can find anything online. If you read through it, it says, what the short-tailed shrew lacks in size is more makes up for its viciousness. The tiny critter is always on the hunt in packs, in packs. And a surprisingly painful, poisonous bite, it chases its prey furiously through the forests and swamps and then paralyzes them with a snap of its jaw. That part is actually correct. It does have toxic saliva, which it has a little channel in its lower uh, incisors that when it bites something, it directs that toxic saliva into it, as did the selenodon, actually. I won't go back to that. So this shrews are incredibly, usually, small animals, but they do have a voracious appetite. So they have a very high metabolic rate, which requires them to be active all year long, requires them, I think it was reading beforehand, to eat twice their body weight every single day. And this particular species um, hunts by itself, and it usually nabs something and bites in the back of the head, back of the, of the spine, so it can get that toxic saliva right away in there and paralyze it. So it is a ferocious creature, just luckily not all that big. All right, so, oh, the biggest rodent that is alive today is a capybara. Maybe you're familiar with it. It lives in South America also. It looks kind of like a little hippopotamus. And you can see it is up to 174 pounds. That's a pretty good-sized rodent. And I found this on the, on, <laughs> so you can see how big it really is. Right. I know, isn't the internet great? There were some very large rodents that lived in the past. So this is the uh, Pleistocene giant beaver. And if you go to the Valley Forge park and look in their museum. I'm pretty sure they still have one of these set up. And there you go. It's 276 pounds, 7.2 feet. So there were some good-sized rodents. That could have done Wesleyan, I guess. All right, and then there's the eels. 
All right, so I, when I first looked at it, I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. But in fact, as I looked around, there are a number of freshwater eel species. This one is in uh, New Zealand, so I gave you the, the uh, of course, the internet again. And you can find stories of the Tanawa. It really does exist. And so you can see it's up to 93 pounds. And there are many stories amongst the Maori about it. So it's considered almost a god type of thing. And as I was reading about it, of course, the internet, it says this person, Clinton Haynes, was swimming, it's a freshwater animal, was swimming and saw these things down below it. And it really does exist. It's the Australian longfin eel. And um, let's see what else he's got here. It does have, they are, they are hunters. They live down at the bottom of the, of the lakes in the sediments, but they do come up and it's, according to this, have an incredible, sense of smell so that they can detect things that they want to eat very easily with very small amounts of blood or whatever it is. Um, so here, here's what it would, here's how big it is. They do make noises. So you might not think of fish as being things that make noises, but they do make clicks and sort of whistly like things. I don't know if it's when they're going to attack a human or not. They don't really eat humans. I put this on the left. I was reading a book about eels, and um, this author said he went to New Zealand and was talking with this young lady, and she's calling the eels up. She's got dog food there, and they will actually come on land and feed from her hand. These eels and all the freshwater eels are really unusual because they live in fresh water, yet when they're going to breed, they have to get to the ocean. So they do often walk across or wriggle across some wetlands to get to the ocean. So they're, they're opposite to salmon, where salmon will come back to fresh water to breed. These leave fresh water to, to breed in the ocean. So along New Zealand, it's not going to be nearby. However, there are American eels, and you can see how big this one is, not nearly as big as that, as that New Zealand one. But they have, um, there it is, the chirping and sucking noises. And look at females can be two, two and a half to three and a half pounds, up to 16 pounds. The males are, so, are much smaller than that. They have a very interesting life cycle in that as the adults go to the ocean to breed, they have this breeding frenzy. They drop their eggs to develop. And those eggs will stay in, let's see, I've got this, the Sargasso Sea, all right? So, on the left is the range of the American eel in, the, in the, our hemisphere. You can see it's all the way from Greenland down to Mexico. They all leave their freshwater habitats, swim to the Sargasso Sea, which by the way is the Bermuda Triangle. And there, those babies, people did not know what happened. It seems like the adults die after they breed and the babies have to make it back. So this little larva, which looks very different from its adult, so it's down there on the bottom right, has to make its way back to the freshwater uh, rivers and streams. By that time, it's two and a half to three and a half inches, and they're called elvers. They pigment up, and when they're adult, we see that they're up to two and a half to three and a half pounds, and then they live maybe 15, 20 years, and then go out to breed again. So that's, that's their life cycle. So people eat eels. Right, so there's a big eel eating industry. All right, I got a little worried about that giant. When I see him climbing up that mountain with three people, or sorry, the cliff, people clinging to him, I said, nobody can do that. I didn't look up the facts here. But here's the real superhero of, of creatures, and these are the, any ant, actually, because you think about it, you flick an ant off, lands on the ground and walks away. What person could do that? So here's our, our leaf cutter ants, and I pull them out because not only are they hacking away at some leaves there to bring back actually to their colony to feed to their fungi, and then they eat the fungi, but you can see the, on, on the upper left, they can haul away pieces of leaf, but other ants are hanging on to it. So they, they really can lift uh, big weights, and I found this on the internet too. So, and it's funny because my husband always likes to try out whether or not ants things will bite him. He's never tried this one. But you can see the one on the left biting it into a leaf. Well, I guess if you let them bite into yourself, they are pretty heroic. I mean, they're pretty strong animals. Ants 
are the superheroes of the world. All right, moving away from animals, maybe. So I wondered about that six-fingered man. Interestingly enough, it says in the United States that one out of 500 births will have this polydactyly. Not as extensive as that. So polydactyly is obviously in extra digits. And it can range from just a little bit of a flap of something to the one that's on the right that has an extra digit that has one bone in it to the one on that left, I don't know what I said before, that actually has six digits like our six-fingered man does. And they're fully functional digits. And the difference is, I was going to say, these items here are in the palm of your hand. So in something like that one there, it doesn't have those metacarpals, but this guy has all functioning digits. And let me, what I've written here is there are various um, mutations and various reasons that cause polydactyly. But one of them is, see if we can, if I can explain this. So here's a fetus. The youngest one is, a, I reversed it so they were lined up nicely. A is very early on, and you can, it's at a limb bud stage. So early on in your development, you didn't have fingers and toads. You just had this little blip coming out, or four little blips, and they are going to develop uh, the different bones and end up with the fingers. And one of the things I'm going to point out here is this is a limb bud uh, labeled with a probe that shows when a particular gene is active. And this is the gene that turns on the developmental machinery that gives you digits. So one of the causes of polydactyly is where the arrow shows that one, for some reason, has an extra place that's expressing that gene. And that's what's going to give them that extra digit. The interesting thing is, is when I was thinking about this, one of my advisees, my new advisee, came in to talk about classes for the fall. And he's one of the really freshmen, tall and skinny guy with big feet. And I like to try to make them feel more at home. So I said, whoa, look at those feet, because he had green shoes on, you know, fluorescent green. And he says, I have six toes. Want to see? <laughs> I said, sure, take your sock off. And he did. He was very proud of it. He did have six toes on both feet. So that's what that one is over there, is a six-toed person. All right, let's see what this is. Oh, then it's the Iocane. So I said, I, can you do that? So normally, you do eat things, right? You're eating food like mushrooms in which you really probably can't handle what's in it. So luckily, when you eat something, it goes into your intestines, starts absorbing those molecules, and, mo and it's going into your bloodstream. But most of that blood goes immediately to the liver. So what the liver is doing, one of the things that it's doing is it has a stock of enzymes, detoxifying enzymes, that will render those toxins neutral, but only if that's something that a person might come into contact normally with, because your, your liver doesn't know that it should have a stock of enzymes. So we have a few. We can eat some things and detoxify it. Master detoxifiers are things like, if I can make this work, yeah, a deer, an herbivore, because plants are chock full of toxins. After all, a plant does not want you to eat its leaves. So it's going to have a number of toxins. If you tried eating various things, you could get very sick. But an, an herbivore has a greater stock of those different enzymes. All right, that sort of answers some of it. Then I began to wonder about the, um, can you actually inoculate yourself in some way that you can get used to a toxin? So there is one way. I guess snake handlers can, uh, they wouldn't be ingesting it. They would have to be injecting a little bit of snake toxin, increasing it all along. And what that's doing is it's causing your immune system, just like if you were exposed to a virus, to start making antibodies. So you can, you can prompt your immune system to start making antibodies to something. But the iocane powder, what is that? Luckily, there are nerds on the internet. <laughs> So this is a great site. You just do iocane powder, and it has a really nice YouTube there. And he's decided that that iocane powder is most likely something like arsenic trioxide. So it is possible, and people have done this. It's often called the kingmaker, because you can, get, you can do, as happened in this movie, um, take, in, start ingesting that arsenic-like substance 
and eventually, and keep upping it a little bit so that when you try eating it again, you actually won't get sick from it. So you can give your opponent who hasn't been doing that, that arsenic, and they will die from it. But as it turns out, as this guy tells us, is that what's happened is that arsenic has actually been slowly killing off your intestine. So as you're trying to absorb it in your intestine, it's actually rendering your, your intestine inactive. So in fact, the reason you're not dying as you keep taking it is because you're not absorbing anything in your intestines. So you will die eventually because you, you haven't gotten enough food absorbed through your intestines. So that's only going to work for a little time. But apparently the arsenic type of things have been, you can find myths about that going back to the Greeks. So it's been well known that those sorts of non-organic, inorganic substances could work that way. All right, so that, that's not gonna, so I'm afraid Wesley made a mistake doing that. All right, so now trying to get back to, could you be mostly dead? And of course that's a tricky subject because I, I mean, I think, how could I talk about this when there are kids in the, in the audience, doesn't sound like a very nice thing to talk about. Because there, are, one way that you might, he might have been affected is if he went into a cardiac arrest. So you can live through a cardiac arrest as long as someone, your, your brain, as long as your brain isn't starting to die, right? So that's, of course, our legal definition of death is when certain parts of your brain are dead. All right, so maybe he did go into cardiac arrest and that's why they were able to revive him. But all I can say is, Mammals and people, they're not very flexible. Once something bad happens, you can't recover. But there are organisms that can recover from a lot of different things. So some of you might be aware that things like lizards can drop off their tail. And I have to tell you that when a lizard and in salamanders, right, which are amphibians, their, their spinal cord goes all the way down their tail. If you looked at a kitty cat or your dog or whatever, there might be a vertebral column within the tail, but there is no spinal cord, right? It stops at the bottom of your back there in any mammal. But in things like lizards and salamanders, it goes all the way through. So when these guys drop off their tails, and in fact, you can see what's written there, is they even have planes of, of amputation that let their vertebrae split very easily so they can drop, just drop that baby off. And Presumably what's happening is it's happening when a predator is going after them because, let's see, what's my next, let's see if this looks, if we look at this nice little lizard at the top, if I try to grab his tail, he just says, here, have it, right? And it's actually usually wiggling at this time, so I'm, I'm holding this like, ooh, food, and he's gone. But this guy is able to then regenerate that tail back, right? So some lizards are really, really good at this. Not all of them. So this is a, a black iguana, so this is Mexico. And this guy has lost that part of his tail and he's having a heck of a time growing anything back. It's even worse if you're, in, this is a, a Galapagos marine iguana. You can see he's trying to grow something back and his tail ought to look like that, right? But he's not having a very good success rate at doing that. So not all lizards can actually regenerate much of anything back. And I stuck this in here for my husband because whenever we go somewhere, I say, take that picture. And that's what he was, so there's an iguana over there, a marine iguana, and he's, he's yes, I will take that picture. So that, a lot of these photographs come from him. Anyway, so this is my daughter too, holding a, an iguana that will, black iguana, which will drop off its tail. But wouldn't you think something smaller and less scary would be nicer to work with? So luckily, salamanders are that creature. So these are our local redback salamanders. You see how big it is right there. And salamanders are even better than lizards in regenerating. So if, if they drop their tail, well, if the lizard drops his tail, it sends some axons down the tail, and it makes a little rubbery, vertebrae kind of thing down there. But it's not really doing it's not replaced exactly the way it should be. With a salamander, everything is back exactly the way it was before. The entire spinal cord, all the, ver all the vertebrae, all the muscle, all the skin, they are just masters. And they are masters at regenerating limbs, so you, somebody could nibble off its hand and it will regenerate it back. Parts of its brain can come back, its retina, so it, its jaw. So Compared to we mammals, they are the kings there. So 
other ones that, so I, I work, this, this is my way of coming to, to the actual research that I do, is looking at spinal cord regeneration in salamanders. So I work with the, the red-backed, but I also work with this beauty, which is an axolotl. And uh, this is a species that's originally from Mexico City area, so it lived in the canals of Mexico City, and they were so abundant at one time that the Aztecs would, would eat them, right? So they're maybe, I don't know, eight inches long when they're adults, and they can live for quite a long time. Obviously, the canals in Mexico City are not doing so well any longer, so there are very few left in the wild any longer, but there, isn't, there is a university that breeds them, and so that's where we often get our, our research animals, and honestly, that's probably one of the cutest animals you've ever seen, isn't it? Right. So axolotl is a, uh, an Aztec word. That's why it looks so strange. So here's back my red pack, my red back salamanders. And take a look next time you lift up a, a, a log or whatever, a, a rock, and you see a salamander. Check out their tail, because these are ones at various stages of regeneration. So like the one at the bottom there is having a little trouble getting muscle back in there, but it's just got to keep eating. It, it'll do it. So when I do study it, I do something like this, which is, so there's that tail, and I will t I'm, I'm trying to see what the cells are doing, what the genes are doing. So I will look at the tip of that tail, and that's what that section is. So I'm able to look at the microanatomy, and I know it probably doesn't look like much to you, but by the time we get to this one right here, right in the center is where the spinal cord is starting to, to return, starting to regenerate. So this or I'm a nice, nice short person, that is a blow up of that picture showing the cells of the spinal cord starting to grow. And as I go this way, I'm getting closer and closer to the body. So now maybe this looks more like a spinal cord to you. And in fact, those two funny light cells with a dark center are actually undergoing cell division. So what salamanders have is all along the central canal of their, their vertebral column. So this is a vertebra, sorry, their spinal cord. This is spinal cord, this is down the center. Here's the cells, all of these are cells. And in them, all of these here are neural stem cells. So like the mother load of cells, which we don't have as adults. But they have them all along that central canal. And when I can do studies in which there's that spinal cord again, here's one that's treated with, let's see if I can explain this. I'm looking for the stem cells. So I'm looking for cells that are dividing, and I can mark them with this green fluorescence. So everything that's fluorescing green there are, cell, are stem cells. And that's confirming that that's, so that black thing in the center is the, is the white central canal in that other photo there. So I can look all down the length of that amputated tail as it regrows and see those, those neural stem cells that we don't have. So the, the way I and my, study, my students study these is by looking at what genes are being turned on and what kind of things that those cells can do that we can't do. And of course, I'm not going to answer the question why mammals can't do it, but that's the sort of basic research that people do in order to feed information to those that are going to go on and solve maybe those sorts of problems, why salamanders can regenerate their nervous system and we cannot. So I think, yep, that's my last slide. So I'm happy to take questions. I'll try to answer it. If I don't know the answer, maybe I'll make it up. I don't know. I'm going to start with a question. Um, how long does it typically take a salamander, like the one that you were showing us, to regrow the tail? So it depends on the species. So this guy, it might take him just a few months. But this, these bigger adult axolotls, that's going to take them, I don't know, half a year maybe to get it back. So not that long, maybe. All right. Do we have any questions in the audience? Yeah. Is that a large group happy brown um, Yes. There, there are happy In fact, down at the Brown um, Zoo, which is a long family brown river uh, just into Delaware, off of the and you can see a pile of them there. That's great. They used the Philly Zoo used to have them. Maybe they went to the Brandywine Zoo. Okay. I have another question. <laughs> what how do you define what defines a rodent exactly? 
okay, a rodent to a mammologist is defined way back to, if I go, is by those teeth. Mammals are actually defined very much by their teeth. Yeah. So that, um, the, actually, the secret to success of mammals more than their brains, woo, I went too far. Sorry, I can't do two things at the same time. So what defines mammals and their roles is the way their teeth are specialized. Our teeth are not all that specialized, by the way, because we're, we're omnivores. But a rodent has the pair of very large incisors in the top and very large incisors below. And those are actually ever-growing incisors, so it, will, it never stops growing. They actually have to, to rub against each other so that they don't get too long. So they, it's, and then that, that space behind, behind it. So it has incisors, there's a big space, and then there's cheek teeth. So that would define a rodent. Whereas that shrew of unusual size does not have that teeth, those sorts of teeth. Oh, sure. <laughs> and is that space behind their large teeth like to allow them to make a big bite, essentially? Essentially, them? that's true, yes. Yeah. So they really are special. Those incisors are to, to gnaw, specialized to they have that hard gnawing bite. And then they, yeah, you have to have some space to make that happen. OK, any questions? There's, there's one right. Oh, OK. She, she'll come back to you. So starfish in order to that. That's true. Well, they're they're pretty distantly related. So they're they have nothing like a spinal cord or a brain. So it's going to be a little bit easier. But they I mean essentially it would be the same kind of genes that are being turned on to let it regrow. So in, in essentials it is. And there was a question way at the front here. In the front row? Yeah, the second row. So what you're saying is with the, the rodent, it's not only not that large, it would be a shrew. Um, so how can you how can you tell them when we're looking at it? It's like it's a bruising in a statue. <laughs> <laughs> Salamanders can survive things pretty well because when we, sorry, when we amputate part of their tail, it bleeds for maybe two seconds and they stop very quickly bleeding. So they're, they coagulate their blood very quickly. So that allows them to survive a, a wound like that. Whereas we have a much slower coagulation response. So it would, that's what he was dying from partly is, I mean, he would have died, right? <laughs> but the, he's going to be key. He's going to keep le losing blood, whereas something like a salamander just stops that blood flow. <laughs> yeah. You. Uh, well, you might not hear me, but this might be cool. But in the salamander, have you done experiments where, uh, depending on how you cut it, could you get it to grow two tails? You know, I, I haven't tried that, but sometimes that happens anyway. So I have. I live in Green Lane, and if you, I don't know if you know where that is, it's north of here, right? And there's a forest around there, and it's always ironic to me that there are so many red, uh, red-back salamanders. They must know I'm there. In, and I've seen them crawling around my deck with a fork in their tail. So that will occur naturally. And the other thing is with the axolotls, when we look at them, if, we've been, if we have been amputating them a few times and look at it, sometimes they'll have two spinal cords. So funny things do happen. When, you, when you're working in the garden and you chop the worm, yes, <laughs> right? Yes. They, I know that they kind of continue to let live, so you can address that. But the real question I have is, how many times can you chop one? How many earthworms do you get? How many <laughs> earthworms? You know, supposedly they will regenerate back both ends of their bodies so that they can survive that. But I have not tried the experiment of how many times you can chop it and still get. 
And there are some other worm-like things like called planaria that you could chop them right. So with a worm, you kind of have to chop them this way. But with a planaria, you could chop them this way and you would still get two, two animals. So a planaria is a small flatworm, which probably you don't notice, but yeah, I haven't tried that one. Not very much, because um, one of the things that, that also marks a shrew, one of their characteristics, is having a really high metabolic rate. And so they, they couldn't, I'm going to put it this way, they couldn't get too much bigger because they just couldn't eat enough, right? So they are limited in how big they can possibly be. And I don't think there's ever been a, a beaver-sized rodent, or sorry, shrew. So shrews have not become ever huge, and I think it's the physiology that's stopping them. <laughs> 